All right, so coming up next, we have Chief Master Sergeant Kimberly Vinson. She is the Chief of the Chiefs Group, Air Force Executive Talent Management Office. She also manages the Command Chief Master, excuse me, Command Chief Master Sergeant Screening Board process and provides guidance to all senior leaders on the execution of Command Chief hiring. She uh, has held a variety of positions in the personnel career field and served four years as a first sergeant as well. So without further ado, please welcome Chief Vincent, your next speaker. All right. Thank you. There you go. Good afternoon. So I know some people got in a little delayed like me, so hopefully, uh, like Chief Morris said, hopefully you guys are awake after the, the lunch you guys had. So I wanted to go over today quickly, um, I think I have about an hour with you guys, to talk about Chief's group assignments, hopefully help answer some of the questions that you might have and clear up some of the uh, misconceptions or rumors that are out there. And just real quickly before I begin, uh, my Deputy Senior Master on Snowden is here also. She's up in the front with me. We'll be here today and through tomorrow. Uh, if you guys want to stop in and see us, ask questions, maybe if you have uh, personal scenarios or, or situations that you have that um, you might not want to ask questions about later on or just maybe you want some one-on-one -on -one time, we are available as well for that. So real quickly, I wanted to go over um, the staff that we have in the Chiefs Group. We are part of Air Force a Talent Management Office, as they mentioned in the beginning, so we're a part of the A1L office. We report directly to the, uh, to the Air Force A1, Lieutenant General Kelly, and I also receive guidance and direction from the Chief Master on the Air Force. Listed below are our individuals in the Chiefs Group staff, and I like to list them down um, just so you can see really how small our office is, um, but with the scope and responsibility that the entire staff, staff has. All the people that are listed up there, they take care of all of your assignments, all of your retirements, all of your exception to policy requests. Uh, to give you an example, for the 19 Bravo assignment cycle, which is the one that just closed out, these individuals up on the board are doing 434 assignments. A lot of it is done by hand matching. So if you'll see your AFSC up there, um, that is your assignment senior NCO. So you are free to contact them. You are free to contact me. All of our information, including our phone numbers and email addresses, are on our SharePoint site. Um, and you can absolutely reach out to any one of us at any time. So the mission of the Chiefs Group is to manage chiefs to meet Air Force needs. What we like to do first off, and our most important role, is to make sure we have chiefs in a valid chief position. So if you are in a surplus, meaning that you are not in a, a valid chief position, um, it is our goal and our responsibility to make sure that we put you in a valid chief spot. Um, personal goals are considered, but really it's secondary to the mission. And really, like I said, the mission is to put you in a valid spot. Um, we also make assignment and development, development decision, decisions, excuse me, and all, everything is accomplished in an equitable manner. I know that it's in a very small font, but I highlighted it in uh, some of the areas that I thought I really wanted to make sure you understand. Us, along with the Colonel's Group and the General's Group, we handle all uh, assignments based off of national, national interests or best interests of the Air Force. So when you're talking about waivers, exceptional policies, or deviations from policies, it is our office that is the final decision authority when it comes to policy. Not for law, but for policy. Um, so very similar to when you were um, considered for assignments as a senior mass sergeant, you would go through AFPC DP3, which is the policy section. Um, everything stays within us, within the Chiefs Group. So if there is an exception to policy that needs to be considered, it'll come through to us. Talked about AFPC, so what makes us different? As I mentioned before, everybody that you saw on that first slide with the staff, we hand match assignments. Yes, there is a system that is involved. It's SLICM, Senior Leader Career Management System. That's where you volunteer for your assignment. That is a part of the process. But a lot of the things that we do, we do with hand matching. And at the end goal, like I said, is to make sure that chiefs are in a valid position. All of the assignment selections are made first by assignment prioritization. What are you volunteering for? What is your one through end list that you're volunteering for? The second thing we look at is your career field manager's priority plans. Some career fields vector individuals, 
but not everyone, do, not everyone does that. But if they do, we also have to look at priority plans and how you're vectored. And then we also look at volunteer status. Um, what also makes us different from AFPC, we have diff they have different tiers and levels of knowledge, and we are specific to one group. Obviously, this just makes up a portion of the group that we're responsible for, the approximately 500 or so of you in the room. Um, but we need to make sure that we take care of the chiefs that are in the Air Force and take care of our senior leaders. We also need to make sure, too, that we have the right fit for the person into the position that they're going into. And then at the end of the day, we try to get to yes. As I mentioned on the previous slide, we handle all exception to policies, deviations, best interests of the Air Force requests. At the end of the day, we want to say yes. We want to make sure that it's the right fit for you, for the mission, and for your family. Um, that's what we try to do every single time. So they talked a little bit about it in the, in the beginning with some of our roles and responsibilities. Obviously, we have uh, our two assignment cycles and two out-of-cycle assignment cycles. We are the Retirement Waiver Authority, so for those of you when it comes time to retire, if you have a, an active duty service commitment or something that makes you ineligible to apply for retirement, all of your waivers will come to us for final approval. We take care of all the Command Chief Selection Board, uh, the training course, and the vetting, vetting and the hiring process. We take care, we are a part of the chief orientation that we're having here, and I'm glad that it's one group instead of having it into nine different locations. This is great so we can get everybody together and hear the same brief. We take care of all nominative positions. I brief at every wing group commander course, um, and I take care of all senior leader development uh, course selection. You have to excuse me, I caught a cold on the way down here, so I'm going to be um, getting some water in between. I'm an advisor on the Air Force Senior Enlisted Leader Council, and we take care of all promotion board panel selections uh, and along with the chief grade review. So I want to talk on the chief grade review real quickly. When I go to the wing and group commanders courses, um, it actually brings up a lot of discussions. So if you're not aware, biannually, the Air Force as a whole racks and stacks from a one through end list of all the chief master sergeant positions in the Air Force. Every, every time we do this, um, we have over-executed on the number of allowed chief master sergeant grades. So with my office, along with the Manpower Agency and half A1M, and the MAGCOMs, the CFMs, the MAGCOM Command Chiefs, we take a look at all of the chief grades that are in the Air Force. And at the end of the day, there are going to be some chief positions that fall below the cut line, which means they may be downgraded to senior master sergeant position. But it's very important that if you're not aware of this process, you become smart about it. Your MAGCOM A1Ms, your manpower folks, they're already really deep into this, uh, this year's cycle, the 2020 Chief Grade Review. Um, but it's, it's important that you know what your job is, you understand what your position description says, because your position description that you're sitting in as a chief is what the board looks at when they determine whether or not your position, position is going to remain a chief position or possibly fall below the cut line. So this year, as I mentioned, A1M is already deep into the process. They have uh, their first suspense, which is one March, for them to get all of the position descriptions uploaded into the manpower system. Uh, the manpower folks, along with the AFSELC and Chief Master on the Air Force, are going to meet on the 16th of April to, to look at some of the positions. And if we have to have a full board, it'll be in August. Um, so this is just a very long cycle. But I want you guys to be aware that, that this happens. The colonels do the same thing, but it's a biannual review. So they'll do it again in 2022. Okay, so real quickly by the numbers, I talked about there's about 500 of you in the rooms. But the folks that you saw on the screen, they help over 3,000 active duty chiefs. We have 181 command chief positions, 33 joint positions. Um, and as of, as of about a week and a half ago, we had 11 chiefs with an approved higher tenure extensions. So I really just wanted to make you aware of 3,000 is a large number, but it's not that large um, when you consider uh, everything that has to be done. So as I mentioned before, we have two primary assignment cycles. So these dates should look very familiar for you. How many of you guys had to volunteer for an assignment this cycle because you were notified that you were a surplus? All right, yeah, lots of hands, that's good. All right, so you guys are very familiar with this process, right? So what, the, what we're doing right now, you'll see the dates on the screen. So this is for the 19 Bravo cycle, which just closed out. So what the team is doing right now 
is uh, by the 1st of March, anyone that volunteered for a SIP position or commander involvement process position, which means it is a, um, the commander has to decide who they want to interview, all of those names were sent to the MAGCOM A1s by the 1st of March. Those hiring authorities for the SIP positions have until the 8th of March to notify us if, who they wanted to select. And on the 1st of April, no sooner than the 1st of April, I'm going to foot stop, no sooner than the 1st of April, all assignments will be loaded. So we have these dates out there on our SharePoint site and um, in some other locations also in Slickums that you can see these dates. Um, and at the end of the slide, I'm going to go through a lot of the frequently asked questions, but probably the first question I always get is, when is my assignment going to be loaded? 1 April. <laughs> 1 April, assignments are going to be loaded, OK? So you see that um, once we get done with the 19 Bravo cycle, we roll right into the 19 Bravo out of cycle cycle. It's kind of weird saying that twice. Um, with the validations due in April, and then we're going to match in May. So the team, the small team that you, showed, that you saw up on the screen, is busy all year long doing assignments and matching assignments throughout the year. OK? OK. So as I mentioned in the beginning, um, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about you guys may have already seen the answers or know the answers to this. I, get, I got all the information out of the chief handbook. So hopefully, when you guys all made chief, you got, you got an email from me. I worked with AFPC to get each one of you an email directly with, to help you answer some of the questions and also get you a link to the chief handbook. So everything that I'm going to talk about is in the chief handbook. Um, I also authorized to be streamed, so I think I'm being streamed right now. You guys can also go back and get this information if you didn't write it all down while I was briefing. So I'm going to go through some of the most common questions that, that we get, um, try to answer the questions, and then at the end, um, if there's something that I didn't answer, let me know. So first, I want to talk about 365 deployments. If you volunteer for and get selected for a 365 deployment, we will not backfill your position. That is different from a PCS. So if you go on a 365 um, short tour PCS, we will backfill your position. But if you go on deployment, we will not back you, backfill you. Second thing I talked about, commander involvement process assignments. Those are the positions where um, you normally have to have chief on for 12, 12 months. If not, um, there was, is there is an exception to policy that's required? Those positions require unique skills or considerations of more than one AFSCs. So think of your group superintendent positions. Those are most of your CIP positions. Um, CIP positions, however, are not by name requests. When we send a list to the hiring authority, we will give the hiring authority a minimum of three names for, it, for them to consider. Um, some jobs have a lot more volunteers than three names. I think this cycle, the most volunteers we had was 65 for the uh, MSG uh, superintendent at Spangdalem. So if anybody wanted to go to volunteer for that job, you were one of 65 names that we received volunteers for. Right, 65, that's one job. So, and as I mentioned, that's hand, hand match. My folks have to go through that and review it. But for those CIP positions, as I mentioned, it's a minimum of three names. We try to give the hiring authority an average of 10 names. And I'm going to say average because it kind of ebbs and flows. So what they do is, um, for all CIP positions, the, uh, the assignment senior NCOs look at a couple things. Um, they're going to look first to see who volunteered. Who's eligible to, to, for that job? Because we have people that volunteer for jobs they, they meet absolutely no qualifications for. Um, we have jobs last cycle that they required flying experience, and people were volunteering that, that were personnelists or finance. So they obviously didn't meet the qualifications. So once they make sure that people are qualified for CIP positions, um, they're going to next look at who are mandatory movers. Who has to move? Who's got a DROS? Who is a surplus? As I mentioned, the, we want to put chiefs in a valid position. So people that have to move, we want them to get a job, right? We want you to get a job. Um, and then also we're going to look at to make sure, do, do they meet the qualifications for a CIP, meaning have they had chief on yet for 12 months? Um, if they haven't, there's always an exception to policy where the hiring authority can request someone uh, in particular that volunteered. But those are the things that we're going to look at. So once those names go to the commander for the, or the hiring authority for the CIP positions, um, then they come back to us. But that's the basic premise of a CIP, CIP assignment. I get a lot of questions of why, if I'm a local hire and I volunteered for a CIP, was my name not forwarded? 
couple reasons. Number one, there were probably more than 10 volunteers, um, which means you didn't make the initial list. Because honestly, if you were a hiring authority, you probably wouldn't want more than 10 names to consider. If you're interviewing someone for a position, 10 names is a lot to look through. Um, and we really don't want to overwhelm individuals. Number two, um, if you are not vectored, even if you're a local hire, if you, if you are not vectored by your CFM for a, a SIP position, then we will not forward your name. So really, those are the two reasons why people's names do not get forward for SIP positions. Okay? So the next thing to talk about is cross-flow positions. So these are positions where they are opening up the aperture on AFSCs that they will allow, and really it's to move AFSCs from an overage career field to a shortage career field. So a really good example is I mentioned, uh, they mentioned in the beginning that I'm a personnelist, so I'm a part of the 3F family. Um, a lot of the 3F jobs, they have opened them up to anybody with a 3F um, AFSC can apply for the job. This also goes for some of the maintenance AFSCs. Uh, sometimes they will cross flow 2A5s, 2A3s, and 2A6s into different positions. Um, and, and for, the, for uh, the medical AFSCs, they can cross flow as well. But you have in Slickums, you can click a button that says, do I want to view all cross flow positions? And you'll say yes, and it'll show you all the positions as well when you're volunteering that allow cross flow. As I mentioned before, my team is going to look at to see if you're eligible. If the job does not say that a cross flow is eligible to apply for the position, and you apply for it and you don't meet the qualifications, then obviously we're not going to forward your name or, or mark you as eligible for that job. So please make sure you're looking at the ad, at the job ad, when you're volunteering for positions. It really should tell you all the information in there. I think I had a phone call this, this cycle, and the question was, um, it doesn't say that cross flows are accepted, but can I apply anyways? I always tell them, you can apply, but you're not going to get hired for the position. I've had people apply for 18 positions. Um, they're probably only eligible for five. Second one from the bottom is nominative positions. Those are what you're talking about, your COCOM, senior enlisted leaders, career field managers, and your half positions. Um, and then uh, the last thing I want to talk about on this slide is um, high school deferments, joint spouse assignments, and humanitarians humanitarian assignments. We as the chiefs group, um, we do approve the exception of policies, but there are certain things we are not experts on. Um, the first one will be humanitarian assignments. So for all of those things, high school deferments, joint spouse, humanitarian assignments, you will request those assignments the same way that you did as a senior mass sergeant. You will go into virtual MPF, you will apply for those, um, one of those, those three assignments, um, and it will come up to us for final approval. There's nothing special that needs to be added. Um, AFPC knows to forward the request to us. However, you still need to provide the same documentation. If you are applying for a high school deferment, you need to have the information from the guidance counselor. You need to have the form from DEERS to verify this, that the, uh, the um, high schooler is your dependent. Um, if you're applying for humanitarian assignments, you need to have the information from the medical provider or from the individual to, to uh, verify that you have a humanitarian condition or need. We are not doctors at the Chiefs Group. We don't have any sort of medical experience, so we rely on AFPC to let us know whether or not it is a valid humanitarian request, but it still comes up to us for final approval. So there's nothing different or nothing special when it talks about those three types of assignments. Okay. So I talk about some of the stuff about applying for assignments. Um, some of the questions I get from commanders is, I have a chief, um, and they've been here for a long time. How do I move them? <laughs> I mean, so there's, there's a couple reasons why people want, why they want to move a chief, right? First one is, is, is pretty easy. It could be because you've been on station for more than three years. Um, Commander might get into place. Uh, you might be a squadron superintendent, group superintendent, and they're going to say, hey, look, this chief has been here for about five years. I think um, they're, they're doing a great job, but I think they've probably been here too long. What do I need to do? They get a hold of us, and they request what's called a fresh expertise request, fresh expertise move request. Um, it comes up to us. Once we validate it, we will go ahead and mark you as a, I say mark, but we will update your record as being a surplus. Um, and a mandatory mover, and then we will, we will move you uh, in the next assignment cycle. We really want 
if you are a fresh expertise for you to volunteer for an assignment. Um, if you don't volunteer for an assignment, we will find an assignment for you. It is not a bad thing to be mar marked as a fresh expertise, um, and hopefully you have a discussion with the commander that is, that is um, marking you as a fresh expertise, and hopefully you just have some frank conversation about what is going on. But really, it's just an opportunity for the commander to come in and go, hey, look, this chief is doing a fantastic job, but I think it's time for them to move on to, to some other place. Okay, so now we're going to talk about non-standard movement. Non-standard movement is different. A non-standard movement is a request that comes up to us after a chief has had either some sort of disciplinary actions or some administrative action against them. Um, this is not a good thing, obviously. Um, it's something that we work very closely with the MAGCOM command chiefs on. We do not approve any non-standard movement requests without concurrence of the MAGCOM command chief because honestly, if you're a chief and you have some admin actions pending against you, then they need to be aware of it. So um, we, we get those. We've had, since I've been there in October, I think I've had five of them already. So this happens. Um, it's unfortunate when it happens, but it, it happens. So it's a way for us, obviously, to move, to move an individual as well after they've had sort of admin actions. I will have a caveat, though, for the non-standard movement. These individuals don't normally remain in the same MAGCOM. Um, because we do not like to move individuals that had some sort of admin actions outside of that MAGCOM unless there's concurrence from the gaining MAGCOM. Um, the, last, the last area I want to talk, talk about real, real quickly is the difference between a surplus and a, and a must mover. I talked about it quickly and, and asked who had to apply for an assignment. You are considered a surplus if there are too many chiefs on the installation and not enough valid positions. You are considered a must mover if you have a DEROS or an assignment availability code that is expiring. So they both mean that you have to move, but the reason why you have to move is just a little bit different. So some people get those two, those two um, terms confused. Okay. So this is what I consider my top 10 list, right? These are the questions that since I've been in the seat, these are probably the most questions that I get asked. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain them um, and hopefully answer your questions. And hopefully um, we won't see these questions out on Facebook or something else because I have people going, hey, what is, what is this? I see this out here on the chief spouse page. What is, what's going on here? So I'm going to go ahead and go through my top 10, uh, top 10 frequently asked questions and answer your questions. And I think I'll have time at the end as well to go through any questions that we have here in the auditorium. Okay. So the first question I get... I volunteered for an assignment. Did I get it, and when will I know? Well, I talked about it on the previous slide, right? When will the assignments be loaded? Right, so one April, you should get a notification that says, congratulations, you have an assignment. If you don't see something by the 2nd of April, then you didn't get an assignment. So that could be, there could be lots of reasons why, right? Um, you could be in a career field where there's just too many chiefs in a career field and not enough positions. The three Delta community is a great example of that. I think that you guys are at about 115% maybe, 115% manned. Um, if you are over manned in, that, in, in a career field like that and we don't have anywhere to put you and you didn't volunteer for enough, enough positions or maybe you just didn't line up to where you volunteered for a SIP or some other or cross flow position you didn't get selected, then you won't get an assignment. And that just means the next cycle you'll, we'll, you'll be notified that you're a surplus again, and then you'll volunteer. Um, and then we will load an assignment when, when the, next, uh, the next cycle comes through. So it's not a terrible thing, but the 1st of April is when all the assignments are going to be loaded. Um, if you call us on March 31st, we're going to tell you that you have to wait till the 1st of April, and that's when you're going to get your assignment. However, if you volunteer for a SIP and you get selected for a SIP, the hiring authority will probably notify you that you got, you got selected. Um, so, but until the assignment is loaded, it is not firm, okay? So my folks, like I said, in the first vapor, we're going to be loading 434 assignments. Can I apply for a cross-flow assignment if my AFSC is not li listed? Yes, but you won't get the assignment. So if you are a, if you are a two alpha and uh, the two alpha three and the assignment says cross-flows are not accepted, um, you, you probably don't want to apply for it because you're not going to get the job. Okay. 
Um, I got tagged as a surplus, so my AFSC is not correct. How do I fix it? So this is a really good question. So we had about three people this cycle that had an issue like this. So they moved either in and out of a special duty. Say they were a 9 Golf or an 8 F. They were a first sergeant. Um, and they were not looking at their records and looking at their AFSC or someone dorked something up. So their control AFSC was not correct. If you remember, um, for, for us personnel, for, for Personnel 101, we do assignments based off of your control AFSC. So we use your control, F, control AFSC to determine whether or not you're going to be a surplus, whether or not you're, um, you, what uh, percentage your AFSC is for manning. Um, that's what we look at. So if your AFSC is not correct, um, then, and we actually mark you as a surplus, you need to let us know. But how do you fix it? You get with your FSS and have them update your AFSC. Okay, number four, how do I volunteer for an assignment? The same way that each one of you did this cycle, right, through Slickums. Do you need to email us? No, you don't have to. Um, probably about two years ago you did, back before we in, uh, implemented Slickums as the assignment for the assignment cycles, we had everybody have to email their assignment senior NCO, but I'm glad we stopped that because we have so many people volunteering for so many jobs, um, it was just overwhelming for us. So if you apply through Slickums, then we will get notification all of us can go in there and see, yes, the MSG superintendent position at Spagnolum has 65 volunteers, and yes, your name is on there. So that's how you volunteer for an assignment. Number five, this is a really good one. I want to get to, move to, retire to, PCS, or do X. How do I get to yes? What I'm going to tell you first off is be honest. We have people that like to call us and either give us a very short exception policy request, they beat around the bush, they don't give us the full answer, and until we start digging, either myself or Senior Master and Snowden, we don't know what you're trying to ask for. One of the reasons why we put all of our names out there and our phone numbers and email addresses is because we want to talk to you and hear what's going on with your situation. But if you say, I want to retire because my career field is over man and I have been the longest serving chief in my career field, so I should retire. Nope, you have an active duty service commitment I'm, that is not approved. Oh, but did I tell you about the, situa the medical situation with my daughter? Did I tell you about the issue that's going on right now with my in-laws? Did I tell you about this? Did I tell you about that? No, um, but we, we need to have that conversation. So tell me what you're trying to do. I will tell you if it will be approved. But remember, things that you're applying for and things that you're talking about, it needs to be, if it's a best interest of the Air Force or hardship request, it needs to be something that is not unique to other individuals. It cannot be about your spouse's uh, civilian employment. Absolutely understand that that is a huge issue, but that is not something that is not unique to other individuals. It cannot be about your children's schools. That is not something that is not unique. If you have a terminal illness in the family, if there is a severe medical condition, if there is something going on that is not unique to other individuals, please let us know. We need to have that conversation. I do not want to delve into uh, HIPAA issues or any sort of uh, privacy violations, but if you do not tell me the situation that you have going on at your home, then I cannot help you. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reiterate that and, and, and foot stomp that, that we need to have an honest conversation. Um, and you also need to have that honest conversation with your supervisors, with your command chiefs, and with your wing commanders. Because for every exception of policy requests that we require, it needs to be approved by your senior rater. We will not approve anything for an exception of policy without written concurrence from your senior rater. Okay. Number six, why do I need to get a written exception to policy? Because we don't, do, we don't do bro hookups. I don't do anything because we used to be friends when I was an airman or because you know someone. Really, it goes back to what I said about number five, having the honest conversation. Um, if your senior rater does not know what is going on with you, then that's probably a, a problem. Um, we need to know written, uh, written on paper, something that we can file, and that if there is ever a, an issue or a complaint or a request as to why something was approved, we have it written. I cannot just blindly make exception of policy approvals or do something because I feel like it's the right thing to do for that day 
because I may have known you 10 years ago. Okay, I, I, I need to have this written down on black and white. Um, I feel that we're absolutely, we, like I said before, we try to get to yes, but I cannot do it based off of a phone call. I cannot do it based off of an email. I need to have something signed um, so that I can refer back to it because if, if it was anybody else, you would want to know as well um, that, that people are backing you up and they would sign their name to the request that you're asking. Number seven, I volunteered for a SIP position. Why wasn't my name forward to the hiring authority? As I mentioned before, SIP positions, we have a minimum of three names that go forward and we bought a maximum of about 10. So a couple of things I'm going to reiterate again. If you weren't eligible for that job, um, if you didn't meet the, the requirements, um, if you weren't vectored for that position, if you uh, are cross flow and the cross flow is not approved, those could be some of the reasons that your name was not forwarded for a SIP position. We will accept exception of policies for a SIP position. So what I've had this cycle is a lot of, um, I won't say a lot, probably about five or six individuals say, hey, this person is a local hire. Why didn't I see their name as it come up on the SIP position request? Um, we will accept exception of policies if people are local and they meet the, they are the best person for that job. As I go, went back and, sh and uh, I'll go back to slide two where I said that we do everything in the best interest of the Air Force and exception of policies, we will absolutely work with you for those requests. Number eight, why do chiefs in an overseas area have to complete 75% of their tour? Okay, who read the chief's handbook that when you got, oh, this is great. Okay, so there was a little blurb in there that we changed not that long ago. So when I came in the office, one of the first things that I saw was Overseas assignments, we weren't getting enough volunteers. Seriously, like I'm talking really good assignments that I would want to go to. Kadena, we weren't getting enough volunteers. We were having to non-volunteer people. Um, but I also realized too when I walked in that we were limiting chiefs to only two overseas assignments back to back. So that was a very manual process because my team was having to look through everything to see, okay, how many overseas tours have they completed? No, they've done two. Maybe one is a senior mass sergeant, one is a chief, so they can't go to another chief assignment. Um, and then they say, oh, what happened to the lights? Okay, and then they say, uh, so we have people we have to non-volunteer for. Who hit the lights back there? So we have people we have to non-volunteer people for, and then in addition, they were having to uh, limiting the amount of um, tours they could do back-to-back -back overseas as a chief. So I went in there, I had a discussion with the team, I had a discussion with um, A1P, and I had a discussion with uh, USAFI and PACF and said, what can we do to make this better? First off, I want to stop non-volunteering people to go on an overseas assignment. If people uh, want to go and volunteer to go overseas, whether or not they've had two overseas short tours back to back or five, if they're eligible and they want to go, then we should let them go, okay? But at the same time, I cannot have chiefs in an overseas assignment leave quickly. Because what was happening is people were getting to the overseas tour, maybe they volunteered, maybe they didn't, but they were volunteering for another assignment 12 months after they got there. And as you know, you can PCS as a chief after 12 months. Um, but we were having too many chiefs volunteer after sitting in an overseas assignment for only 12 months. So as you know, this, is, this leads to uh, a loss of continuity within the unit. We spend a lot of money to send people overseas. It normally takes a while for folks to get settled. Um, there's, just, there's a lot of extra stuff that has to happen in an overseas area. So how do we fix this issue? What can we do to at least make this, make this better for the overseas locations um, and really try to help them out? So what we implemented was chiefs have to be in an overseas area and have to complete 75% of their tour before they can PCS. We are not doing that because we are um, not trying to punish the folks that are in an overseas area. I've gotten that question before. But what we're trying to do is build some stability overseas. When we take people out of the overseas area, there's so much that goes into it, and you guys know this. You talk about medical clearances. You talk about everything that's involved to get folks overseas. Um, if people are rotating out of there within, after 12 months, um, it is very hard to get people in there, especially if we don't have the volunteers that I need or that we need to get people into those overseas locations. So starting with this last cycle, you have to have 75% of your tour completed within the assignment window. So for this cycle, I'll give you an example. 
The report dates for this assignment, for this assignment cycle were July to December of 19. Sometime within this assignment window, you must have had, you must have 75% of your overseas tour completed to volunteer for an assignment. To volunteer for an assignment. Doesn't mean that you won't get picked as a non-volunteer, but to volunteer. It really has to bring stability to the unit, to your family, um, and to the overseas area. We do exception policies. We will waive this um, if you are volunteering for a nominative or a SIP position, but we will only do that if you have concurrence from your MAGCOM command chief. If you don't have concurrence from your MAGCOM command chief and you haven't completed 75% of your tour and you're overseas, don't volunteer, for an assignment. don't volunteer for an assignment because you will not get one. We will mark you as ineligible to move and you will have to com com compete for an assignment during the uh, assignment cycle where you have completed 75% of your tour. Um, I have been asked if we want to do something and change how we do the assignments for, for CONUS. Um, as of right now, we haven't made any changes, but I will always up to, to more discussion. But really, this was a decision that was made between my office, uh, USAFE and PACOF, and really, how do we keep chiefs stable in an overseas environment when we just don't have enough volunteers? So it is not to punish folks that are overseas. Really jealous of the folks that are at Kadena because I always wanted to go there. Okay. Number nine. My friend is not marked as a surplus. I use friend in air quotes. My friend is not marked as a surplus. Here's his name. He's my friend. Right? Why am I marked as a surplus? Okay, sir. Number one. I am not going to talk to you about your friend's record. However, I will tell you that the folks in the office, they do a very good job of screening people. Um, we do make mistakes. We are human. But I can guarantee you that it's probably, uh, both of your records are probably correct. So trying to figure out why someone is marked as a surplus and why you're not or vice versa or how come he's more eligible to move and I'm not, what's going on. Um, if your friend has a question, tell your friend to call us. We'll, we'll gladly answer and pick up the phone and, and answer that question. Um, but please don't call us and ask us why someone else got an assignment, um, but you feel like the two of you are equal and that the two of you guys should be considered equally. Just have your friend call us. I know that you know, discussions are had and everyone knows about what everyone's short tour return date is and who's more eligible to go on an overseas short tour and the last time that someone got back. Um, but you guys can have that discussion, but please don't call us and ask us why the other person was marked surplus and you're not. So I will caveat this, this, uh, this discussion. A lot of times people are asking, why do we look at chiefs and chief selects the same when we talk about, when we talk about surplus status? Because once you become a chief select, you fall under our assignment rules. Um, so we're going to look at you as a chief, whether or not you're wearing chief or not, because that's, that's how you get an assignment. You get an assignment from us. So after every chief release, we look at the entire, we look at the installation, we see how many valid chief positions there are and how many chief and chief selects there are on the installation. The individuals with the longest time on station, those are going to be marked as a surplus, whether or not you are a chief or a chief select. Okay? I see some heads going up and down, so I think you guys are picking this up. Okay, number 10. Can I swap my assignment and surplus status? No. <laughs> no, you can't. Um, we, are, we, like I said, we look at every single person's record individually. Uh, if you got picked as a non-volunteer for an assignment, it's for a reason. Uh, or if you are marked as a surplus, it's for a reason because you've been there longer. I have done one exception to policy, one for a surplus status. There were four days between the two people, four days difference between the date arrived station of the two individuals that they were considering. Four days, not four months, not four years or whatever, four days. Um, and there were some family issues and there were some other things that had to be considered. That is my one and only surplus swap that I've done so far. But other than that, we do not swap assignments. If you got now volunteered for an assignment to go to base X and you call me up and you say, but my friend, Chief so-and-so over here really wants that assignment. Can you, swap? Can you swap with us? No, number one, because I don't know if Chief so-and-so really wants that assignment or if you're just calling me up and telling me that because you don't want to go. 
Because that could happen, right? I mean, if you got someplace fabulous like, I mean, Holloman. I was at Holloman for two years. So if you got someplace fabulous like, like there or, you know, maybe um, pick a base that maybe you're just really not interested in going to, um, I don't know if your friend really wants to go on that assignment or if you just don't want to go. Um, so I don't, I don't know. But no, we do not swap assignments. We do not swap surplus statuses. We do not swap um, anything to do with assignments. We just, we don't. Um, so, so sorry. Okay. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, chief development. As I mentioned, one of the things that we do is senior leader development within the office. Uh, so there are courses that we work with A1D, excuse me, A1D, and we send chiefs to uh, different courses uh, throughout the United States. And your MAGCOM command chiefs take, takes care of, indiv of selecting individuals to attend some of these development courses. All the courses that I have listed up there, that's not, that's not all of them, but it's, it's the majority of them. You can see the entire list on our website and in the handbook as well. But if you go to these courses, you have to have two years of retainability upon graduation date to complete the, complete the course. I think, and obviously, um, some of you already went to the senior uh, enlisted legal orientation course here at Maxwell. But these are great courses. So if you have the opportunity to attend these development courses, please do so. Okay. So I went through that pretty quickly. I did that in 41 minutes. I think I have about 10 or 15 minutes to go through questions. Or if I can help clarify something that I went through that maybe you just didn't understand. Wow. I think, lying. I think so too, because I know that every day my email box is, is blown up with like 50 emails of, hey, when am I getting my assignment? One April. One April. Oh, the question right there, perfect. Hey, afternoon, Chief. Good afternoon. Uh, it's uh, Chief Thompson. I'm from uh, Med Group over at Scott. <laughs> so our uh, question, you said um, hiring authorities tend to get minimum of three. You try to keep it to around 10 mm -hmm. candidates. So just because you get an email from Slickham saying that you are forwarded as a candidate doesn't guarantee you an interview. Is that a good assumption? Hiring authority might just look through them all yep. and say, ah, you know what? I'm just going to interview these three. Correct. So that email from Slickums shouldn't make you feel any good. Well, it should, no, it shouldn't make you feel good. No, because we're all, we're all special, Chief Thompson. We're special. We're special. No, it shouldn't make you feel good, but that is correct. Because we tell the hiring authorities they have the option to do a records review when they determine if they want to um, select the individuals. They can do an interview. A lot of people will do an interview. Um, especially when you're talking about these large organizations, we talk about group superintendents. Um, a lot of them will will do an interview. But yes, um, you are special because your name was forwarded. Um, yes. So, but yes, you, that does not necessarily mean that you will get an interview. Hi, doing, Chief uh, Senior Master Sergeant Chris Craig, I'm the 82nd Conference Coordinator Superintendent out of Shepherd. Uh, so I was non-involved in that job. It's a it's a vectored KLP job. About six months ago, uh, made chief, and now I'm surplus. Okay. Uh, no other 3D chiefs slots on base. Uh, are there any special considerations taken for that type of thing? Um, you know, we talk about stability in the units and things like that, but I've only been there six months, and here we are possibly maybe not getting assignments since we are overmanned. And I mm -hmm. talked to, you know, CFM. He says I'm way down on the list, but there's really no transparency or way to, for me to know that at the, in the end. So I'm really just waiting till 1 April. But are there any considerations taken for that? Yeah, yes, because for every, there's always an exception to policy. I will say that. If you're in a position that requires longer stability, um, I just worked with AFSOC on this. They had a chief select that went into a very, very specialized position that required um, language skills. Um, they're standing up a special ops school over in, in uh, Europe. Um, I have agreed to hold them over longer than this assignment cycle. Um, but there's got to be a specialized or a, a specific reason why you will not move the cycle or why we need to keep you in that position longer. You're shaking your head. You're not, that's not happening with you? No. Well, there's really no special uh -huh. skills. Okay. I mean, it was just a KLP. Right? <laughs> so we got one with, with that feels special and with no special skills. Really, though, right? no. I mean, really, it's, it's just a you know, senior master sergeant superintendent yeah, gig. Yeah, got but, it. Okay. So, so nothing special, but. Right. 
So, so for you, so for those that are in a surplus career field, what I recommend is really look and look at the cross flow positions that are advertised for the cycle. You know, go ahead and throw your name out there and see if it's. Um, I don't know if maybe you used to be a shirt before or volunteer for an eight tango for an instructor or look at the nine the nine series or eight series positions. If you're in a surplus career field, look at those and see what is appealing to you and your family and volunteer for those. Don't limit the, don't limit yourself to just the, your own AFSC. Because if you're in a surplus, it's it's very difficult sometimes for us to find you an assignment. Yeah, well, you know, there's mm-hmm. definitely some jobs out there I wanted. Yeah. But it's just kind of the whole not knowing piece of uh, of not knowing if I'm leaving mm-hmm. or not. And right. So one thing I didn't talk about was when I, t- I, I talked about the dates, I said March 1st, we send the names out to the hiring authority. March 8th, we need to have all the answers back on who's, who's uh, rack, um, their commander's choices, one through whatever. We, uh, we complete all of the CIP positions first. We get all those jobs hired first, and then we move on to the functional assignments next. Um, so it's very important that the hiring authorities, when they get the list of names, that they stick to those positions, because if not, it holds up the rest of the functional assignments. Because you have people that volunteer for SIP assignments. If they don't get the SIP assignments, then we have to find you a job in a, in a functional assignment next. Um, so that's really why it looks like it takes a long time from the 1st of March to the 1st of April, but it's not. It's about a week and a half for the SIPs and then about a week and a half for the functional assignments. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Senior Master Sergeant Harris uh, coming out of Turkey. So my, you said this current one is for September of 19? July, July to December of 19. December, mm-hmm. okay. So all of the jobs that I volunteered for and that I saw on there, the RNLTD was in the summer. However, my DROS isn't until October. So how does that work? Um, and second part of the question, is the DROS or the surplus taken into consideration first? Yes. Because you have a DROS, you're considered a must mover. Um, so we're going to, like I t- when I said, we forward the names of those individuals first. If you volunteered for a SIP or a, a special assignment, we'll forward your name first before those that don't have to move. Um, what, what we are able to do is we can flex with some of the report dates. So if you have a September report date, I'm um, sorry, so if you have a September DROS, we will adjust the RNLTD to match up with your DROS. Wow. So, correct. Yep. So you will finish your tour there. And if you volunteer for an assignment and you're matched to it, we will adjust the report date to match up with your DROS. Um, so but because we do everything internally within the office, we have the flexibility to do that. We work directly with the uh, MAGCOM A1s if we need to adjust the report dates, but we make sure that we align both of those things. So if your DROS is within the assignment cycle window, we can flex and adjust things. So don't feel that you're limited to something just because you have a DROS. Okay? We'll, we'll adjust as, we, as needed. Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, Senior Master Sergeant Knotts from Mountain Home. Uh, quick question with EFMP. If we do get selected for an assignment and it comes back with a medical denial for the mm-hmm. base, how does the processing work after that portion? Okay. So similar to uh, um, when you were a Senior Master Sergeant or for a humanitarian assignment, if you, uh, if you get, uh, if it's found that they cannot support you and your family uh, for the EFMP needs, um, AFPC will come to us and say, here are the locations that can be supported, that can support you and your family. And then what we will do is look at the positions that are available at those locations and match you to one of those positions. If for some reason that lo- those locations don't have any jobs available, we may have to wait until the next cycle to put you on assignment. But we're going to go ahead and look and see what either they, they, you, they can take you as in your AFSC or maybe cross flow you. But that's where we work one-on-one with the EFMP folks um, and the medical folks over at AFPC. Whether it's EFMP or humanitarian, they'll let us know. Um, so this, this, um, this last month, we had a request that c- come in for a two Foxtrot chief. Um, he was requesting to go to McGuire um, because of his family issues. So we went and looked, and we were, luckily were able to find a valid 2F, 2F position for him at McGuire, but if we couldn't, we were also looking at bases nearby. We looked at Dover, we looked at Hanscom, we looked to see what we could do to support him and his family. But just like, just like AFPC did, did with that, we work one-on-one with the, with the folks at AFPC to see how we can support your family. Same goes for joint spouse assignments as well. For those of you that might be um, joint spouse, if your spouse is uh, the rank of senior master or below or an officer, we work with AFPC uh, to get you matched up for a joint spouse assignment. Um, to, to make sure that it can be supportive for both of you. Did I answer your question? Yeah. All right, there you go. 
Frocking. Do we want to talk about frocking? Okay. So Chief Gudgel here in the front, she wants to talk about frocking a little bit. So frocking uh, came out about a year and a half ago. A uh, decision was made that if you're going into a position that required um, the rank of chief, uh, we're talking especially for, and you're talking in a joint environment, um, the request needs to come up to us for frocking. Um, we do not want to see you already in that position. You have to be moving, it, this has to be before you move into that position. Um, and then the request goes up to Lieutenant General Kelly uh, to, for final approval, the half A1. Um, and then he, he approves it and then it comes down. Um, it is not meant um, for, a, you know, if, if a commander wants to hire you to be a group superintendent, um, it is meant for specific positions that requires the skill set and the rank of a chief master sergeant and you are the right person for that job um, to go in there. Answer your question, okay. Wow. Do you have a question? Okay, good. 500 people, this is like, like four questions, this is crazy. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I needed OJT on the mic. Oh, right there, it tells you how to do it. <laughs> it does. Yes. It's Senior Mass Sergeant Gloria Wilson, I'm at the Pentagon. Um, so my question is, when I read through the handbook, mm -hmm. I thought the only exception to policy that was needed for the 12 months was 9G positions, but I saw on the slide it said all sit positions. Is that new? No. No. But um, a lot of a lot of this, the uh, 9G well the 9G positions are sit positions, but they do that really because of the skills that are needed from the chiefs that are walking uh, that are going to be taking those jobs. Um, a lot of times too, you have to look at the ad as well. The ad will tell you if you have to have 12 months as a chief in order to apply for the position. Um, but just like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna repeat this over and over again. You may see something, but if you feel like you're the best person for that job, or if a hiring authority has reached out to you and said, hey, chief select so-and-so, I, I have a sit position that's opening up. I think you would be great for it. Why don't you go ahead and volunteer? Volunteer for the job. If the hiring authority really wants to interview you and select, possibly select you for that job, they will get a hold of us and figure out how to do an exceptional policy to get your name on the interview slate and possibly hire you, okay? So that's another thing too. So if you have commanders out there, if you have group commanders that you've worked with before, um, we, will abs we will do and, and work with these commanders one-on-one -on -one to do exceptional policy, so don't limit yourself by what you see. However, um, if you don't meet the requirements for the job, um, and it's going to be a really hard sell. It's really tough for us to approve the exception of policy if you don't meet the skills that are needed. If it's a medical, if it's a, a medical uh, uh, sit position and you are a two alpha, it's probably not the right fit whether or not you worked with that commander before or not. Okay. Wow. Hey, Chief. Oh, there you are. Way in the back. Okay. Uh, Adam Guest, I work at uh, Dias Air Force Base, 7th Munition Squadron. Uh, I'm in a situation where the sitting chief is the surplus, but because he's on a deployment, he was rendered ineligible for this assignment cycle. If he, he'll still be the surplus next uh, cycle, but he's eligible to retire. So if he retires, how soon does, do I become the surplus? Remember my question up there? It was like one of my top ten about, hey, if my friend calls, why is he marks as a surplus and I'm not? Didn't I, didn't I talk about that? I get that, but <laughs> I'm not asking specifically for him. I'm okay. asking for me. When what, do I become the what? surplus? <laughs> I love these questions. <laughs> when do I um, become the surplus? It depends. If he so kind of, kind of like you know, school, right? It depends because you throw a lot of assumptions in there. You're assuming that just because he's eligible for retirement, that he will apply for retirement. Right? So until people are, are actually, um, they apply and are approved for retirement, we cannot assume that they are a valid loss and that we look at them as a loss. So um, come see me afterwards and I'll look and see what uh, your base and we'll look at the uh, AFSC Manning uh, for the 7th Munition Squadron just so I can take some notes. I could probably give you a better answer. Thank you. You're welcome. See? That was like number five up there, right? 
<laughs> Just kidding, I don't want to mess with you. Go, yes, sir. Senior Master Sergeant Robbins from uh, Travis Air Force Base. So my question is, uh, if you're interviewed for CIP positions and multiple commanders pick you, how does the rack and stack go then if you're picked for multiple? So it depends on where you're racked and stacked with the commander. So if you have, if you, say you're super awesome, right, super special, who is the guy that said they're special? Say, say three commanders picked you as their number one. We're going to look and see what did you volunteer for first. If your number one links up with a commander's number one, you're going to get that job. That's how we deconflict it. Very important, though, that you guys, you know, you remember what you volunteered for. So we had someone last cycle, they thought they were slick, right? So they volunteered for, let's say, six jobs. They interviewed for a position. They found out they were going to get hired. They went back into Slickums to try to, tra cha try to change their ranking order, right, to match up with the one that they, they thought they were going to get hired for. What they didn't realize is my folks print out on the day that the assignment cycles close what your ranking order is. So if you try to change it after the fact and you try to be slick and say, hey, that wasn't my ranking order, this is what I, this is what I want, nope, sorry, we knew what your ranking order was and this is what you volunteered for when the assignment cycle closes out. And we really do that to be fair to everyone because we can't have folks changing their assignment preferences after they get interviewed. It really is it's whatever when the assignment cycle closes out, that was what you volunteered for. But that's how we deconflict. We really have to look at, and that's what I talked about, it's hand matching, right? Because we have to look at what does the commander want? Does, does a hiring authority want you? Okay, if so, where does that rank up with your volunteer preferences? Um, and that's how we, that's how we decide um, what and what assignments you're going to get loaded for. So I will, have, I will say this too, if a commander says, hey, I want to hire you, you're my number one, um, we still have to look at your volunteer preferences because we have had times where like, commanders will say, this is my number one, but they don't always get their number one because then that might not have been the individual's number one choice. And so we'll have to go back and say, sorry, sir, ma'am, you're not going to be able to get your number one. Maybe you get your number two, your number three. Okay, I'll stand up here for about five more seconds. Um, as I mentioned, myself and Senior Master and Sunun, we are back in, uh, I don't know what room we're in, but there's a sign on the door that says Chiefs Group. Oh, I have a question. So while this person's walking up, so we will be here this afternoon. We'll be here the rest of the day, so please come by, see us. For the individual from the 7th Munition Squadron, please come back and see us as well. We will answer your questions. I will be here tomorrow as well. I do have a meeting tomorrow from 9 to 11, but I'll be here um, from 11 to about 3 o'clock to answer any questions you might have as well. And like I said, if there's a certain scenario, a certain a special scenario, a unique scenario that you have, please come in and talk to us. Ask away and ask questions. It's really a lot easier for me um, to sit down and pull up the records and to see what you might have going on in your record. In Good afternoon. Good afternoon. This is Chief Nicholson out at Beale. I've got a question on the guard and reserve part. Is it ever considered to be blended or to backfill some of these vacancies on a temporary basis? Kind of create more of the blended TFI? We, we do for the command chief positions. Um, however, it is, it is difficult at times when you're talking about, um, especially for MPA days or having to get, to get funding uh, to bring a reserve uh, individual onto active duty orders. Um, it really requires a lot of, a lot of coordination, uh, and I'll give you an example from the cycle. We had an individual selected for a command chief position. Um, we had to work uh, very diligently with half A3 uh, with the reserve force generation cell to, to make sure that there were enough MPA days to cover not only the deployments but for the training that's required because this year they, there was just a lot of issues with, with doing that. So I, I will say that the reserve, uh, the, the, uh, reserve Command, they're actually in the process right now of standing up their own chiefs group. So they're on the fifth floor right above us. So they're, used, they're starting to use Slickums. They're trying to develop their own development process and their own uh, command chief screening process and figuring out the best way that they can utilize and manage their chiefs. Um, the Guard as well, but they have, they have a separate process. But as far as filling some of these under, other slots, no, we haven't gone that far. Um, but we do integrate the Guard and Reserve as well into our uh, senior leader development courses. So all those courses that I showed up on the screen, a lot of times you will see guard, Guardsmen and Reservesmen in those courses as well. Yeah, because there's a REGAF Air Force gentleman that is now uh, active duty Reserve Command Chief. 
in the east, and it's looking pretty good. In Delaware. Isn't it McGuire? Uh, there is a, there's an individual, he is an active duty command chief. He is at a, a reserve base out in Delaware, 166. Um, that's, what, that's one of the uh, TFI positions that I'm aware of. Hey, Chief. Uh, yes, sir. Wade Steinbach from uh, Columbus Air Force Base. So I'm a 2A3, and this last cycle there was about 13 uh, different positions that were available. Uh, if I don't get picked up for one that I volunteer for, is there any something or is there anything that the Chiefs group does uh, before matching somebody to an assignment they didn't volunteer for? Or is it just April 1st comes, congratulations, here you go? Okay, so let me get this right. So you're a 2A3, you said you, repeat your question again, you said you volunteer for positions? Right, so mm -hmm. I volunteered for, you know, several positions, but right. there was about 13 of them that are out there. Okay. So if I can't get matched to one of the ones that I wanted, uh, is it, does the Chiefs group reach out to say, hey, we couldn't get you one that you want, you know, here's the ones that are still available, do you want to rack and stack these, or is it just I get assigned and that's it? No, so what we're going we're gonna to look at those 13 positions that you volunteered for. So our goal is to match you up with one of those 13. Um, 13 is a, is a lot of jobs. So assuming that they were all two way three positions that you were eligible for, it's probably more than, more, more than likely than not that you will get one of those jobs. Right, so uh, I'll recap. So it's, there's 13 jobs total that are for a two way three that were available. Okay. So if I only volunteered for four, if I don't oh, get one okay. of those four, okay. do you guys match me to another job that just has an opening? Yes, maybe. It depends. <laughs> It depends. Nice. It depends on how many how many people volunteer for those other nine jobs, and if someone got selected for them. Um, but we our goal is to try to match you up with one of those four. Yeah, I just wondering if it's one of those like, do we get any kind of a heads up if we're not no. matched? Or? No. So probably about two years ago, they used to do what was called soft matching, where before the assignment was loaded, we would sometimes reach out to the chiefs and go, hey, uh, this is what we have open. This is what we could and couldn't fill. Uh, what do you think about that? Or what do you want to do? But it's, it's 434 assignments too much. It's too much for eight people to do. So, so no. Um, probably not, but we're going to try to match you up with one of those four positions. And if you don't get one of those four positions, then the good news is you will get into a valid 2A3 chief master in position and do fantastic out there and do fantastic work out there. Track and thanks. You're welcome. Okay. So the lights are off. So um, I think we're going to move on to the next briefer. But as, as I said, we'll be here this afternoon. Please stop by and see us. Um, we have capability to look up records and to do other things, but um, please stop by and say hello. It was great, uh, hopefully, meeting you guys throughout hopefully the next day or so. Uh, please stop by and see us. And congratulations again on making Chief, and uh, thanks for what you guys do every single day.